Hey guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bass. And today we're talking about four major mistakes that bass anglers make in the fall and what you can do to avoid them. Bass fishing is tough enough without us getting in our own way and making it harder than it has to be. In the fall, we all make mistakes, me included. There are some things that we do as anglers that just plain make it tougher to catch fish. And today, I wanna take a look at the top four of those and what you can do to change that so that you have better success when you're on the water and you're spending your time more effectively. The first one, is a huge deal and a lot of anglers don't even realize that they're doing it. Guys like to fish when they're comfortable. We like to go to the lake when it's nice out. We go out there on those beautiful, sunny, nice days. That is a mistake. Now, if that's the only day you've got, by all means, go fishing. But if you have a choice, you need to be out there on the nasty days too, the days where the storm fronts are coming in, the cold snap is arriving, and here's why. In the fall, bass are in transition. Yes, they're still feeding, they're aggressive, they're chasing bait fish, but winter is coming and transition is happening. Bass are beginning to shift towards their winter haunts, the places they're going to spend winter. And the times that they make their moves when they start shifting is not on the beautiful days. They shift on the bad weather, when the cold snap hits, when the rain arrives, when the wind is blowing. Those conditions that aren't ideal, those are the things that get fish moving that get them headed towards where they're going to spend the winter. So if you're only fishing on the nice days, sure, you're catching fish, but you're beginning to see that you're on dwindling patterns. Meaning, if you're doing the same thing every time you go out that's been working, it's probably by now beginning to slow down for you. You're not catching as many as you were. Those fish are transitioning, they're making their moves, and if you're there on the nice days, you'll never know where they went in between. One of these days, you're gonna show up and your pattern is done, and you won't have a clue where those fish went. If you fish on some of those rougher days, you get out there in the cold, you get out there in the wind, you'll immediately notice the shift in the patterns and you'll start seeing how those fish are transitioning. Maybe they're not in the back of the cove where they were last week. Maybe now they're out there at the point at the front of the cove. Maybe you've been catching them on the back of the flat and all of a sudden they're shifting out of there. They're headed out of that cove all together off that flat out to the break, making a whole move out to the main body. If you're there on the rough days, you can follow that transition and you'll figure out where they're headed. If you're only there on the nice days, they'll make their move without you and you won't have a clue where they went, when it happened, or which direction they were going. You don't even have breadcrumbs to try and put together your next pattern. Be there on the rough days. That will help you follow the fish because here's the key. Bass get really stable in winter. Unless something major changes, huge shift in water level, uh, a giant cool down that lasts for multiple weeks, unless something major happens, once fish set into their winter locations, maybe that's a main lake point, maybe that's down on the bottom of a creek bed, uh, wherever you find those fish where they finally lock up and stay put, when you find that spot, that can last for several months. Those fish will not move from that area. They've come there to spend the winter and you can pick them off all winter long. But if you blow it, if they move and you don't know which way they went, that ship has sailed. It'll take a lot more time at a lot colder time of year to try and get back on some fish. Mistake number two, 
This is another biggie. Again, we like to be comfortable. A lot of people just fish the midday. They get out there 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, 10 in the morning. They're off the water by 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. And you might catch some fish. That's great. But if you get home, get on social media, and you're seeing that other people are catching giants, and that just bugs you because no matter what you do, you're not running into those fish. You're catching the little guys. One of the biggest deals this time of year, I don't know why. I'm not going to sit here and explain the why behind it. I'm just going to tell you that through the years, the vast majority of my giant fish between the fall transition and winter come first thing in the morning. First thing. If you're sleeping in, if you're eating breakfast at the restaurant before you go to the lake, you're missing that window of opportunity. This is the time of year that you wanna set an alarm, you wanna get up early, and you wanna be out there as that light is just starting to happen. It's not the most comfortable time to be on the water, especially if it's one of those rough days. Maybe the rain is coming in, maybe it's gonna be a windy day, and you're out there first light, freezing cold, but those are the days when the magic happens and it happens early. I've actually been in a situation with Tim out fishing on a morning that was so cold, the boat had been out the night before and it had moisture on it. The whole deck had frozen. It was so cold that morning, this cold snap had come in. It was first light and I got the opportunity to catch a 12 pounder on a crankbait. Tim and I were out there, he scooped that fish for me. We went to stick it in the live well so we could get the scale out. The live wells were frozen shut. The deck was frozen shut. We couldn't get to anything. It was a disaster. We had to put the fish in the net, net over the side of the boat, and then take cups of water and pour it all down the seams just to get it open, to even weigh this fish and take pictures of it. Those uncomfortable mornings, what I'm getting at, that's when those freaks of nature make their move. That's when those giants get caught. That's why some people are on them and some people just aren't. And if you're one of those guys that just isn't, you might not even be doing anything wrong. You're just not out there at the right time of day. It's a major deal this time of year. The third mistake. This is a simple one. A lot of people, as things start slowing down in the fall, they start going to those more natural presentations. Until it's truly cold, until it's truly over, you still want to throw baits that have that something extra, either rattle or flash. It's a major deal. Probably the two biggest examples would be when I'm, I throw a crankbait a lot this time of year, up shallow, square billing, I want all of the crankbaits, this is me personally, my personal confidence, I want my crankbaits to have some rattle to them. Not a ton of rattle. I'm not throwing my loudest baits. They're subtle rattles because the fish are dirt shallow. They'll chase the bait in the backs of those pockets. And in the back of a pocket, that environment is quiet. So if you're dead silent, that's one end of the spectrum. If you've got a super loud rattle, you're too far to the other end of the spectrum. I wanna be right in the middle where I've got some rattle to my bait. The reason why is you need to stand out from all the other bait fish. Bass are corralling shad, they're corralling baby bluegills, baby crappie, baby perch, and they're actively feeding on those fish. When there's that much food present, it takes a little something extra to stand out and be noticed by the fish. So when I'm cranking, I want that rattle. And when I'm throwing swim baits, I want that flash. There's two ways that I get that flash. It's either an underspin or an okashira. Underspins, I'm going natural this time of year, but I still want flash. So I'm throwing small swim bait profiles. This is the head that Tim and I designed with Dirty Jigs. This is our tactical finesse underspin. Uh, we felt like there was a hole in the market that a better underspin could be made that would hold baits longer and would allow you to fish more styles of bait. And we built this underspin. It came out earlier this year. It's got a heavy duty one-aught hook. So you can throw that down on 
five and six pound line, but you can also throw it on 10 pound line because it is a stout one-aught. Perfect pairing for like a 2.8 Kitek. One of the best baits there is for just covering water and getting a bite on a tough day. That's on a 3 16 ounce. That blade will just sit down there and spin underneath that bait because your little Kitek out there swimming in the water, it looks like 10,000 other shad around it. There's nothing to get them to eat that one. But when you add that flash and that vibration, that is enough of a difference that you're different than all the other shad and the fish will target it. You'll be amazed if you throw a bare swim bait next to an underspin, the underspin will blow the swim bait away almost every time in the fall. There's just that much bait fish up shallow on virtually every lake and that makes a huge difference. Now, the one thing with this swim bait or with this underspin is we wanted it to be able to throw a lot of bait. So the other bait that we throw a lot this time of year is that three inch Largo shad. You guys know that, that's not a secret. We built this bait with this long dropper arm so that we could still get that underspin to spin because a Largo shad is thick. It's tall top to bottom. Most finesse underspins, the blade won't spin under that tall profile. So we made sure that we clear that one as well. So either way, a 2.8 Kitek or a three inch Largo, this is more subtle, this is more aggressive, but both will fish on that same head. And then the Okashira is like the ultimate subtle presentation, but still with some flash. This is paired up to a three inch spark shad. The Okashira is a screw head, see that? So it's not an underspin. The blade is on the head itself, like a little helicopter blade. But if you look closely at this blade, one side is much smaller than the other. The result is that it's lopsided. As it comes through the water, it gives it this funny rock. So this bait will be fighting itself coming through the water and it gets a neat little motion to it with that blade spinning out front, given the flash and the vibration. When the bite gets really tough, especially in crystal clear water, that Okashira becomes a major standout. So if the water's clearer, give this a try. If that water is anything from clear to truly murky, stick with that underspin. But both are great options, but again, don't get caught throwing those supernatural baits. When things start shutting down, we start thinking, oh, I've gotta get more finessey. I gotta get more natural. That's not always the case. This time of year, flash is key. And then last but not least, the last huge mistake that I see people make is they focus all their time on baits that require a bass to want to eat. If you've been watching a lot of our baits lately, our baits, a lot of our videos lately, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If this is a first for you, I'm about to explain it. Baits like a shaky head, a drop shot, a jig, uh, most soft swim baits. These are baits that require a bass to see it and then decide to eat it and swim over and eat that bait. It has to look good and they come and they choose to eat it. That's great, but this time of year, again, we're in flux. Things are changing. Weather systems are rolling through. One day it's beautiful, the next day it's cold. One day it's calm, the next day it's windy. Hot, cold, back and forth, huge systems moving through. When that's happening, relying on baits that bass want to eat, you're relying on them to be in a good mood and that's not always the case. But there are a handful of baits that will trigger a feed response in a bass. Even as I'm telling you this, there's literally a wind line coming to me. I'm talking about it being calm one day, windy the next. Look how calm this water is. We're about to get hit by a wind line coming across the lake. That's just the way it is this time of year. But there are some baits that trigger a feed response. They don't rely on a fish wanting to bite. They get fish to react, regardless of whether they want to bite. There's only a handful of baits that do that effectively. These are in no particular order. There's four of them. The first one is a jerk bait. The jerk bait with that dart and stop, 
dart, stop, dart, stop. And the way it will suspend in front of those fish can trigger that feed response. It sits there above them, it gives the fish time to rise to it. And then when it makes that harsh movement and jerks away, they react. It's not a, it looks great, let me swim up and taste that. It's a, what am I looking at? And then when it tries to get away, cat and mouse, just boom, they react to that. This jerkbait in particular, if I could only have one, the Mega Bass Vision 110 Junior Plus One. That's the matte shad color. If I only had one, that's the one that I use to try and get a fish to react. The next one is Speed Cranking. We just covered this in depth. This is the Tactical DD75. Again, Speed Cranking, burn, 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 pause, burn, 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 pause, burn, pause. Gets those fish to fire up and chase after it. Whether or not they want to feed, they will react and eat that bait. The next one is a glide bait. The glide bait, unlike a soft swim bait, you can trigger a feed response. Soft swim baits, you throw them out, you wind them back, they look good, the fish follow them, they decide to eat it, they attack. But a glide bait takes it to another level. That bait's gliding along, doing its thing, and you can twitch it aggressively and get it to snap, snap, make these sharp movements. When you do that, you can get a feed response again from those fish. You can get a fish following, and then that first twitch from a fish's perspective, they're following their prey, and they're thinking, I'm gonna catch this thing. It doesn't even know I'm here. They're creeping up on it. When you twitch, that bait will turn sideways. Well, now there's eye contact between prey and predator. This bass now either has to do it or let it go, one or the other. That next twitch, twitch, twitch. That next twitch, this thing darts and starts to take off. That's what it looks like. That fish, now they know they're busted and the prey is running. They're either gonna lash out and crush it or they're gonna let it go, one or the other. But that's how you trigger a feed response with a glide bait. Again, this is a fantastic option, that Spro Chad Shad. I'll link all this stuff in the video description, the specific baits, favorite colors, you know, the Okashira head, the underspin, all that stuff in the video description, along with some budget gear to fish them effectively. Last but not least is the A-Rig. The Alabama rig, we all discovered when these things first caught fire and took off, the Alabama rig perfectly mirrors a school of fish and bass react to a school of prey completely differently than they do a single prey. They get aggressive and will follow a school. Now, Tim and I are very specific about the A-Rigs that we use. In fact, a few years ago, we built our own with Hog Farmer. We built the Tactical Flex Rig. This is even smaller than that. This is the Tactical Mini Flex Rig that came out last year. We downsized everything. This thing has three, we put the heads on, but I like to fish it with three one eighth ounce heads. The result is that you can throw this thing on a medium heavy rod, 15 to 20 pound line, no big deal. A lot of people don't like A-rigging because they feel like they're out there throwing a giant swim bait, right? Big heavy gear, it's not fun. That is out the window, that ship has sailed. We're throwing this on a standard jig rod. The big deal is this is a flex rig. So very light wire compared to a traditional rig. The reason we did that, again, we're looking for a feed response. When I'm swimming this thing through the water, I've got three dummy baits on top, three hooked baits on the bottom. I'm swimming that school. I use the same thing I do with a glide bait, twitch, twitch. Winding along, pop, pop, keep winding, pop, pop. Whenever you twitch that thing, that whole rig, when you twitch, it speeds it up. And when it speeds up, these flexible arms collapse and that school pulls together and then immediately spreads back out. That's exactly what a real school of bait fish does when they're being chased. You'll see them, they'll be cruising along, all spread out. As soon as a predator shows up, they tighten up 
And then if they think they're busted, they just explode and run for it. That moment where that rig tightens up and opens back up, that gets that same feed response from the bass where they lash out. That's their moment to attack. That's their moment of surprise and they go for it. So the A-Rig again is another fantastic option. Guys, fall is an amazing time to be on the water, but if you're getting in your own way, you're making it harder than it needs to be. There are a lot of mistakes you can make, but these are four that almost everyone makes. If you can avoid these, not only will you catch more fish right now, you'll catch fish on the good days and the bad days, and you'll be tracking the patterns and you'll be much more prepared for the winter bite once it arrives. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll talk to you soon.